Hello and welcome to the Football to the Max NFL Preview Edition. As on this week's show, we are doing the AFC North, uh, which obviously includes the Cleveland Browns, Cincinnati Bengals, Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Baltimore Ravens. And we have uh, somebody representing each team to give their thoughts on the team. And of course, we'll give our thoughts on the team and then final standings and records and everything else but uh, guys it's been a couple days anything going on has it has it been a couple days it seems like i was talking to you guys every 20 minutes anymore <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> yeah well, especially for me and gary it feels like it just yeah. never ends yeah it doesn't a constant loop it's you know it's like i'm in that was it groundhog day or uh the butterfly effect or something like that. I don't know. Uh, but I'll tell you this. Uh, that's not what bothers me. What bothers me is this heat. I, I cannot wait till fall. Jesus, man. I, I go out and play with my daughter, push her on the swing set. I, I'm out there five minutes. I just want to die. I just let's, let's get to fall as fast as we can, please. Yeah. Uh, don't blame me on that, you know. It's, it feels like it goes by fast, and it's like, well, here, let's just get to the... But then you got to be talking about, like, Christmas and all that, about worrying about buying presents and... Hey, yeah. I, I, I'm, I know that sucks, but the closer I get to fall, the closer I get to getting on that big boat and going and sitting on the beach and enjoying cooler hot weather, not scorching hot weather. So. Well, uh, you know, I was told by a few people that it was sort of scorching in... Where you live, Randy? Randy. Yeah, he burn up. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> know. No, we, we talk weather and I fall. I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> We're like some forty-year-old old men right now. How about the weather? I don't know. Get some coffee. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not. Uh... Let's not talk about the weather much longer. You might get the people uh, turning off here. Uh, So, like I said, covering AFC North on this show. And we're going to start with uh, the team. We kind of know, I think everybody knows where they're going to be at when this season's over. And it's the shortest interview that we have on this one. It goes about 13 minutes here with Samuel Beckenstein from Fansided. Dot com talking Cleveland Browns. Alrighty, I'm here with Samuel Beckenstein. We've had him on the podcast several times now. Cleveland Browns fan and writer for Fan Sided. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Doing good, doing good. So, you know, obviously the Browns have had lots of turmoil yeah. uh, since the last time we spoke here. Johnny Manziel officially not with the team now. Robert Griffin III seems like he's going to be the quarterback as opposed to the other quarterbacks that are there. Is it still a battle, or have they figured out anything yet? Or uh, Well, right now the word is that Robert Griffin III will be the starter in camp and possibly coming out of camp. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he was the guy who ended up getting the nod this year given Josh McCown's uh, injury history and his inconsistency, and the fact that Cody Kessler's never taken a snap yet, 
But uh, the way I see it, Robert Griffin's more of a bridge guy than he is a starter down the road, unless he just absolutely loses his mind and goes MVP status this year. But I, I, it's hard to see anyone else taking over the reins by the end of camp. Yeah, I mean, the Browns, this is that first year of Stashi and, and having the trying to take the money ball approach. They obviously didn't sign too many in free agency. They had the big draft. What did you think? Uh, I like the strategy a lot, actually. Uh, I think it's good to not spend money in the free agency and kind of save up for the big money guys that are going to be coming out of your own program, especially the ones they just drafted. Uh, I'm a big believer in this draft class. They have a lot of talent, which is something you can't usually say given recent history, but this one seemed a little bit different. They went after high-character guys that have had proven success on the field and a lot of broken records if you look into it with all these guys. So I think they did a really good job building through the draft. And uh, the money ball aspect of it could actually pay out to their advantage here. Uh, they're going for guys that did well in the minutes they got, in the snaps they got, and actually made productive things happen when they were on the field. I mean, Corey Coleman, obviously one of the big standouts, along with uh, Emmanuel Agba, they, instead of opting for maybe one of the other, he seemed like one of the big receivers coming out of the draft, do you think? He's going to, having that Baylor connection, he's going to work well with RG3? Uh, I think he will. I think he'll pan out, which is really good to say uh, as a Browns fan. But, of course, we said that before. Uh, I think he will pan out, though. He has that quickness, the ability to make plays happen, good route running ability. But he still needs a little bit of tuning up, considering he played in a hurry-up no huddle with Baylor. But uh, I think that connection with Baylor and Robert Griffin III will be a good thing in the long run. And it'll definitely help them get established pretty quickly heading into next year. A lot of people were saying, you know, after the draft that uh, they reached for Cody Kessler and there was other better quarterbacks left. Do you like the pick of Kessler or should they have gone somewhere else? Uh, Well, personally, I would have waited another round because I agree it was a reach in the third round. But Kessler is a really good quarterback. If you look at his numbers, you look at the way he plays, he kind of fits the mantra that they want to make, which is that blue-collar attitude. Uh, he's a gym rat. He's a guy who's in the office early every morning. And there's been nothing but good things coming out of Bray about him so far. But uh, there were other guys on the board, like Connor Cook, you could argue for the pick. But there have been some issues about his character. And that's the last thing that people needed in Cleveland after the whole Mandel saga. And then some of the other quarterbacks from that point on dropped off. But you could definitely make a case for picking a guy like Dak Prescott there or Connor Cook or whoever else. I mean, obviously the Browns are in a tough position coming into this year. Where do you where do you expect them to how do you expect them to do this year? Uh well personally my expectations aren't that high. I've just kind of accepted that they're gonna be in the basement for another couple of years. But uh if I'm the way I'm thinking it is, they're going to tank, not on purpose, it's just the way it's going to be, and have the number one selection for Deshaun Watson coming out of Clemson to be that franchise guy next year. And then they're going to use the other pick, which will probably end up being a top ten with the Eagles pick from the Carson Lunch trade to get another top tier player and build around both of those guys. Do you think we see any of the old Archie 3 at all here, or is it just going to be one of those cases where he needs a lot more help before we see it, or is he kind of limited um, because of the injuries? You know, I think they're trying to do something a little bit different with him. You know, they've taken the approach that they want him to get rid of the ball more instead of tucking it and running to preserve himself. Hugh Jackson's a really good quarterback whisperer, so he'll we'll see what he can do there. But I think there's a chance you could see some of the old Robert Griffin with the big play ability, the ability to extend plays, and the ability to make smart plays. But I think over and under, or overall, it's going to be an improved Robert Griffin from what we saw the last couple of years. Now that he's had some time to rest, some time to mature, and a good coach kind of getting after him now. I mean, you kind of already said where you expect the Cleveland Browns to be, so they won't be big fighters in this division. But where do you, how do you see the rest of the AFC North? Yeah, they're they're all really talented teams. Uh, Baltimore. You look at what they did last year with the uh, top 10 pick. You can say they had a bad year, but you look at the injuries that racked up for them. You know, their number one receiver for most of last year was Kamari. 
you know, you're not going to get very far with that. And then the backup quarterback play was subpar to say the least. Backup running backs for guys that had very little touches coming into the year. So I'd expect them to be improved this year, given that Flacco is coming back healthy, Steve Smith's going to be coming back healthy, and uh, Justin Porchette's going to be coming back healthy. And they got some improved positions in the draft. Like Kenneth Dixon's going to be a really good running back for them, I believe, out of Louisiana Tech. And then you got Cincinnati. They're very talented. Even with the loss of Hugh Jackson, they can still withstand that easily. And I see them as another playoff team. And uh, obviously you have the Steelers, who are just loaded on offense. Even without Martavis Bryant this year, they're still going to be a lethal force. Uh, what about the the Bengals? Um, I think they're going to be a wild card team again, like they were last year. They're very talented. They have two really good running backs, AJ Green, and they picked up a very good receiver in the draft in Tyler Boyd. Good possession guy, good route runner. Uh, his name was always in the Bolitnikov conversation when he was at Pittsburgh. So I think they got a really underrated guy in him, and they're going to be able to keep churning out yards like they always do. But uh, as always, it comes down to the play of Andy Dalton. Because bottom line, if he plays bad, they play bad. I mean, last year he showed that maybe he is better than just kind of mediocre. Do you think a lot of it was Hugh Jackson, or was it him as in you expect another year like last year from him? Uh, I'd expect another good season, but obviously we'll see if it was Hugh Jackson or not the way he plays this year. But I believe he's a good quarterback until the postseason, obviously. But uh, I think they're going to make it back there, and he's still going to continue to play well. So for the Browns, I mean, a lot of their problem last year was the defense was just letting everyone through. And, I mean, they picked up some good pieces, uh, Raheem Moore and Emmanuel Ogba. Do you see them at least improving on that aspect this year or Yeah, kind definitely. Of the same? And I believe they're going to improve for a number of reasons. You know, Ray Horton's bringing in an entire new energy into that defense. They've seen improvements in camp already in their energy. They said they've been firing around the ball. They've been hitting more. And another thing that I always thought was weird last year when Jim O'Neill was coordinator is that they let the defensive players, the defensive linemen, freestyle what they were going to do. So the linebackers didn't know what gap they were going, what move they were going to do, and what their containment was. So they were just freestyling and going off what they were doing. So I think that was a bad system, and I think you're definitely going to see an improvement. Because when they went from Ray Horton to Jim O'Neill initially, you saw a drop-off in where their defense was. So I'd expect them to kind of go back to that level, maybe even a little bit higher, because they have had an improvement in talent this all season. Yeah, certainly they have, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, having the new the coach and, and having the difference in players, that's going to that's gonna help them. Uh, sorry, my daughter decided that she wants to mess with the doors, trying to <laughs> temper expectations that I might have to, like, stop her from coming in here. But so what do you think is the best? You kind of told me, okay, worst case is there at the bottom and – and exactly where they were last year. What do you think is sort of a realistic best-case scenario for them? Um, I think, personally, I believe that is the best-case scenario. Um, you develop your players, get them some reps, see what you have in guys like Coleman, possibly even Kessler, Robert Griffin, and some of the other young guys you drafted. And then you use those two potentially top-ten picks to continue to get guys you can build around, get focal points, get centerpieces. Like I mentioned earlier, Deshaun Watson out of Clemson more than likely will be the first pick if they're the guys on the board there. And then you just continue to build from there. Realistically, you're looking at a 3-13 and or another 4-12 and season. As bad as that sounds, it's probably the best thing that could happen, though. So is there anybody that you think will sort of have a Gary Barnard season that maybe we're not – thinking about that nobody's really talking about I mean not a lot of people are talking about the Browns period but if <laughs> you, you know if, if we're not sitting there paying attention and then all of a sudden do you think we have another player like that that okay this is a guy we got to pay attention to Browns wise uh there are two players that could potentially fill that spot uh number one another tight end EJ Bibbs he was an undrafted free agent out of Iowa State last year He's a good possession tight end, especially in the red zone. Big guy, good run blocker. He fits perfectly into Jackson's scheme. 
and they could use him and Gary Barnage like Tyler Eifert was used in the Bengals' offense. So he's a guy to watch if he makes the roster and continues to uh, build on the momentum he got at the end of last year. And another guy to watch on defense is Derek Kindred, the safety they drafted out of TCU. Very hard hitter, very talented player, played most of the season with a broken collarbone last year. Very tough guy, and I'd expect him to earn some playing time in the defensive backfield this year. So he's another guy to watch on special teams and uh, defense. Should we have what kind of expectations do we have for Josh Gordon after all the stuff that's gone on with him? Well, actually, today he met with uh, Roger Goodell. He can reapply for reinstatement on, I believe, it is August first. Uh, if he's cleaned up his act, he can come back, and I believe that there is a spot for him in Cleveland if he does come back. He gives them an instant weapon, a guy that you have to pay attention to. And if you look at it, that definitely bolsters their receiving core very much because you look at what they have now, and the projected top two receivers are going to be Corey Coleman and Andrew Hawkins. Now, those aren't two big receivers that you throw on the outside. Those are two guys you'd expect to see in this slot if you look at how they size up. But Gordon gives them a big guy they can throw to on the outside, a guy who can stretch the field, home run ability, and if you pair him with the Coleman or Hawkins or any of the other guys they have, that's just an instantly better tandem than what you have now. So if he can get reinstated, I fully expect him to come back to Cleveland and start as soon as he can. Do you see him sort of being the old Josh Gordon, even though he's had the time off? Uh, I believe so. I think he will be. Uh, he's had this kind of thing happen before. He's spent a lot of time off the field before, and he's come back. Uh, I think he will be able to return to form after a couple of games. I mean, like we saw last year, he was a little bit rusty coming off against Atlanta, but then he rattled off, I believe it was seven catches for 75 yards in the second half of that game, which led to the game-winning field goal. And after that, he just kind of tapered off because he got suspended again, and we haven't seen him since. So obviously there's a fair reason to expect a drop-off, but I believe he'll be able to return to form. All right, Samuel. We I think you answered all of our questions here, so I did, I want to say thank you for helping us out, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, no problem. Uh, you're always a uh, great help every time you uh, can come on here, and and hoping during the season we need a. a... All right, I meant to cut it earlier, but uh, my computer was just saying I wanted to be a turd and be slow. Uh, so, uh, I, that's probably one of the most realistic takes that I've heard on a team that we've had on here, saying their best case scenario is to basically wind up where they are right now again. Um, any, I mean, any thoughts here, uh, on the Browns? I mean, we kind of know where they're at. Yeah, I'm there. I'm right there with them. I mean, you can't have your expectations that high here. Uh, I'm higher on on RG3 than I think some other people are, uh, just talent-wise. But there's nothing else around him, so it's not like he's going to make a crazy resurgence, whether Josh Gordon comes back or not. Uh, There's just not a lot of talent here, and I I think the fan base, you know, is just uh, barring down for just another miserable season and I you could kind of tell a little bit of hope in his voice there for in a few years like uh, I think he's he's feeling like things are are starting to go in the right direction but he knows it's it's small steps when you're when you're at Cleveland you're not going to go from three and 13 to 11 and five yeah, exactly. And, you know, they've done a lot of good things when it comes to trying to fix some of the issues they've had. I mean, going and getting them a quarterback, you know, sure, like Randy said, you have people who, you know, think RG3 is going to just revamp his career. And you also have people who kind of believe that, oh, well, that's fine. He's going to do nothing there, too. I don't know, but I'll say this. At least they addressed it. At least they addressed the quarterback position besides just drafting guys because we're noticing that, hey, you know, that trend is not working in Cleveland. Stop signing guys the number one draft picks uh, to quarterbacks. It's just not working out. So uh, just go actually get you a free agent who's been there, done that, and work with him, see if he can get you going somewhere. But, you know, you've got to have the cast of characters, and you've got to have them complete – 
this roster is still incomplete when it comes to superstar level guys. You've got some okay players. You've got guys that are going to work hard, but I just, I don't know. I, I think you got to tamper your expectations and, and really just kind of expect the same thing. Yeah, I think most Luthen fans at this point, with uh, that new system that they have in there with uh, the Moneyball deal and all that, that you should be expecting that this is kind of the way it's going to be for a few years. They've got to restock on the talent. Uh, they've got to focus on the younger guys and so you can have them around for a while and so that you can build a good nucleus and everything from the draft, from places where you can trust them more instead of having to rely on just signing the veterans and hoping they do well and then they leave you and mm-hmm. and you go back to the same thing again. So uh, I, I like what, what Sam was saying here uh, about the team and having a positive outlook on it instead of, you know, sort of being a bit negative. Yeah, and, and listen, I mean, if there are Cleveland Brown fans out there that, you know, are are trying to be optimistic about the season and you know we've had had a few people where I've disagreed where they thought their team was going to make the playoffs so if you are out there and you think Cleveland can make the playoffs I would like to uh, point you to your schedule this year because the NFL has decided that they wanted to make sure Cleveland had no chance uh, they start this year five of their first seven games are on the road there are two games that are at home in that seven week period is hosting Baltimore and hosting New England and that's after that's the the week Tom Brady comes back. Um so don't expect to win any of those. And I mean just you look at their home games the whole year. I, I see maybe one or two that they could win. I, it's it's tough. They have a very tough schedule for a team that went three and thirteen last year. Yikes. Well I think we can uh, move on now from the Browns and go ahead and talk to, you know, a good friend of ours, friend of the show, Mr. Robert Hagen, talking Baltimore Ravens. He's pretty much Mr. Ravens at this point. Hello, and I am here with Robert Hagen, Baltimore Ravens fan. Of course, we had him on the podcast several times now. How are you doing today, Robert? I am doing great way up here in the Pacific Northwest. Going to hit 100 degrees up here, so probably nothing close to what you've got down home, but uh, doing great. Yeah, over here it's just always uh, humid, so even if it's not 100 degrees, it feels like it. it exactly, exactly. Does it hit 100 over there a lot? Uh, dur- dur- during the summer it does. It does. Uh, we've had a crazy start to the year. This is probably going to be the first triple-digit day that we've had this summer. Uh, June has been nothing but rain and cloudy skies, so not getting much fishing in this summer so far. So, you know, the last time we talked, I think, was before or right around when they were starting to sign guys. So what did you think of free agency and then the draft that came after the Ravens? Uh, looking pretty good. Uh, pretty excited uh, seeing Ronnie Stanley. Um, they really think that uh, he's going to be the starting left tackle. Nobody's going to really um, probably put up a fight in that position. Uh, I like the look of what's going on there. Uh, the other um, rookie they're looking at for offensive line might give him a little bit of uh, a chance to get in, but it probably be very slim, and that's Alex Lewis. Um, he's right now probably sitting third on the depth chart um, behind John Urschel and uh, Ryan Jensen. Uh, the other rookie that stands out to me is going to be the running back Dixon from Louisiana Tech, but now that's going to put six running backs now for the uh, Ravens, you know, with... Uh, uh, Javarius Allen, Justin Forsett, the signing of Trent Richardson, Terrence West, and uh, Talia Farrow. So uh, running backs are going to look pretty deep along uh, with that. Yeah, it seems like 
they're going to have to drop a couple of these guys, right? They can't keep six on the roster. I, you know, I wouldn't think so. And the other thing that really stands out is the um, tight ends. You know, we're, right now they have five on the roster, you know, with Boyle, um, Crockett Gilmore, Dennis Pitta, um, Ben Watson, <laughs> and also picking up um, – picking up uh you know max williams last year and so signing him last year so five tight ends on the uh on the roster is going to be awful uh large 11 guys right there that are going to make things a little interesting yeah i mean obviously it seems like they're going to have to make some tough choices there when you get to that training camp and whittling it down to the 53 but I mean, the Ravens had an interesting season with all those injuries, and we're still able to pull it out in various games and not look too bad. And I mean, they fought in every game, and that's a that's a, always a big plus for your team. Shows that they were actually pretty good. And then they had the unfortunate thing of having uh, Joe Flacco go down. Yeah, you, you and I talked. You and I yeah. talked about that. That was a huge thing. Is you know, by the end of the. Uh, season we had had 21 guys hit the injured reserve so and one you know losing Terrell Suggs week one um losing Joe Flacco the last six games I mean there was a lot of things that uh caused all of that yeah so I mean you seem pretty happy with Bonnie Stanley no no second thought of maybe going defense instead with a Joey Bosa or or Buckner <laughs> Now, you know, I was happy to see both of them. You know, it was uh, uh, it was tough for me to watch the the draft that day. I didn't get to watch much of the draft. I listened to your guys' podcast and uh, and the live podcast while you guys were doing that, and and that was how I figured it going into those two picks. It was one of the two. I, I knew it was going to be Vasa or it was going to be Stanley. So. Um, Stanley now looking at what's going on with the offensive line is going to be a huge thing. You know, uh, they do let go of, um, uh, assembly and let him go. And so I think that's going to be a huge, a huge thing for the Ravens is to get that offensive line shirt up. You know, the right side looks really good with Zuda and Marsha, uh, Marsha Yanda and Rick Ragnar. Um, I, I think Stanley is going to be a great, uh, great option for that left tackle position. You know, we'll see if he fits the old Jonathan Ogden, you know, Jonathan Ogden being one of the best left tackles for the Ravens ever. And, uh, I, I think uh, Stanley might just jump into that role. Yeah, certainly. I mean, one of the things that kind of stood out for the Ravens while they were having that season where they just kind of had to play with the backups was the receiving core, you know, with Kamar Aiken and uh, Givens and everybody else that sort of played for them last year, especially once, you know, Steve Smith had to go down. Smith decided to not uh, go through with his retirement. And you know, along with Steve Smith, you come in and add Mike Wallace. You pick up a Keenan Reynolds in the draft and have a few other guys. I mean, it seems like that receiving core now a little bit more stacked in case you do have uh, someone go down. Oh, yeah, 100%, you know, and we look at, you know, I, I hate Rashad Perryman still has not seen one snap in the NFL, you know, from Central Florida was going to be a big pickup. He has been healthy all summer, been working out, and, and you're exactly right. Mike Wallace is going to be a huge, uh, huge person there. You know, got that experience along with Steve Smith. I mean, that what could, what better could the Ravens ask for is to have you know those two guys going and having you know Campanero who's in his third year um, and. You know, I don't know much about Chris Moore, the rookie that they uh, signed this year. Kind of looking forward to seeing a little bit of uh, training camp to see what he's going to offer to the whole mix. So uh, kind of excited with that one. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the the offense last year wasn't really the problem for the Ravens. I mean, it, it obviously hurts to lose a Terrell Suggs, who's like, you know, the heart of your defense. Um, but I mean, that seemed to be their issue is they could keep it close, but they had to really keep it with trying to keep up in the scoring range, not necessarily stopping people. Do you think that they maybe have addressed the defensive issues this year? Well, I think so. I, you know, last year you look at uh, one person that really stood out, and that was Will Davis. You know, Will Davis signed uh, or, you know, got traded from the Dolphins, but only made two game starts. And in those two game starts, he made a huge difference. There is a, a corner um, uh, with Jimmy Smith. And, uh, you know, and then he goes down. Last year was a year of of tons of injuries and, and I'm excited to see, you know, Will Davis, um, they're saying he's pretty well a hundred percent, you know, and he's going to be trying for that, uh, other corner position with, uh, Sharice Wright along with Jimmy Smith. Jimmy Smith is pretty much a shoe in at the one corner. Um, the signing of Eric Weddle. Uh, I'm excited to, you know, I, I'm, you know, I follow being out on the West coast. We do get to see San Diego every once in a while, so it's kind of nice, but uh, kind of excited to see him in uh, purple and black. So, and having you know, um, Terrell Suggs back, uh, you know, we do lose Daryl Smith, but uh, I, I'm lo- really thinking that this might be a, a lot better defense than it was last year. Now, is it the best defense that we saw, you know, in 2001 or back, you know? Um, it'll be a lot, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. You know, Ladarius Webb should be that, uh, main defensive back here for, for, uh, the Ravens too. So I think he shoes up the nickel defense. Uh, so I, I think the defense will be a lot better, you know, and you and I talked at the end of the year and when we were wrapping everything up we talked about it the ravens only lost the eight games they the games they lost most of them were eight points or less and there was a substantial amount that was three points or less you know so it's like you said it, it, you know it wasn't just the offense the offense was staying there it was a mixture of things, so I, I'm I'm excited. I'm ready for football to get going. I'm ready for to see these guys start and where you know um, Eric Weddle fits in with Terrell Suggs as being that veteran and seeing Mike Wallace and Steve Smith being the big targets for Joe Flacco. So I mean, Justin Tucker got his extension. He did indeed. So- now he's you know going to be there at least four more years. But now there's talk about this whole thing with the microchip and the ball and trying to narrow those field goal posts to make it harder for the kickers. What do you think about this? Just uh, understanding that you know the Ravens are one of those that rely on their kicker a lot to score. Yeah, I you know I not I'm not a fan of putting the microchips in. They're starting to change so many things. Uh, uh, there was like an article I read yesterday and, and listening to Amy Lawrence on CBS radio yesterday and they were talking about, okay, if you could change any aspect of the games or any games, any sports, what would it be? And seeing these guys talking about putting microchips in, seeing these guys start saying, okay, well, you get up one point only if you go 25, make a 25 yard kick. If you're 30 to 35 yards, they're wanting to make it worth two points and farther and changing the point system. I, you know, I'm, I'm old school. I, I, I don't care how long it is. If you can kick it that long, kick it. I, I do like the, the fact of the, you know, the 30 yard field, the extra point. I do, I did like that change. So we'll, we'll see, but you know, there, they're putting a lot of technology into stuff, but, you know, look at what's, what it's done for the game. So getting into now this upcoming season that's train camp's about to start, where, what are your expectations for the Ravens coming in? Well, you, you know, getting that defense healthy, that's the main thing, you know. We lost a lot of defensive guys last year. Um one guy that has stood out, you know, on the team for many years 
and I'm very surprised he didn't retire. It was Dennis Pitta. You know, you look at Pitta, uh, part of this five-man tight end group, uh, you know, they were pushing for him to retire, you know, because of injuries and that. So it, it's going to be tough, you know. Um, one thing I have been um, really keen on and, and looking at stuff has been um, – has been the schedule for the Ravens this year. And, you know, last year we talked about them making four trips out west, and that's one thing that I think is going to be really good, is if you take a look at the schedule, you know, we have the Bills in week one, um, and then the Browns, you know, so right back into conference play but the farthest the, the the Baltimore Ravens will travel west will be Dallas and that's going to be in week 11 so they're they're not going to be flying all over the country this year you know where we made four west coast trips last year you know kind of kind of plays with them I and mean, we've all talked about that before so I'm looking forward the the schedule looks really good you know you, you see the Browns uh week two but uh the tough part is we don't see the Steelers until after our bye week in week nine, and then we see them in week 16, you know, and so, um, and the same with the Bengals. We don't see the Bengals until the uh, week 12 and week 17. So we don't see a lot of our uh, AFC North guys until after the bye week. So, you know, if anything happens in uh, weeks one through seven, you know, we're going to have a little bit of time to get these guys healthy and uh, ready for the AFC North. Oh, well, certainly. It looks like, uh, you know, you guys are going to have to play my Cowboys too. So, well, uh, that'll be fun when that game comes around. But, uh oh. Oh yeah, there's you know a lot of my a lot of uh, Randy, my friends uh, are and, and Randy's outplayed. Jets too. So all of us, yeah, are good to have yeah, we'll, we'll play them all. But uh, you know, a lot of our friends here are Cowboy fans, and I've already got like three side bets with uh, some dinners on the line and that kind of stuff for uh, uh, this this year. So lots of side bets for me this year with who we're playing. Should be fun. Uh, see if you can collect on some of those, you know. Oh, well, you know, on all the cowboy games here lately, and I'm not picking on your cowboy, uh, you know, uh, the cowboys or anything. But uh, every bet we've I've made against the cowboys has been a Ravens win. So we're looking to extend that again this year. <laughs> well, on my end, I'm hoping that that is uh, not the case, but. So, you know, looking at the rest of this division, I mean, we kind of know where the Browns are, but the other two are sort of kind of been the the top two in the division. Do you think it stays that way, or do you see the Ravens really going for it as well? You know, you and I have talked about this a, a fair amount of times. I just – AFC North to me is just the toughest, toughest division in all of football. You know, there's a lot of people that will argue that with me and say uh, different divisions and all that. And some, they, you know, they're talking about the AFC South this year is not going to be – the slacking division, you know, but, uh, you know, when you go into Cincinnati or you go into Pittsburgh, you know, you're going to be putting up a fight and, you know, Mike will tell you the same thing. You will be putting up a fight, you know, every time that Pittsburgh and play, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. So I see those three teams being at, at the top. Um, it, for me, seeing it's going to be another put up or shut up year for Cincinnati. So it, Cincinnati's got to do something this year. If they don't do something, I see a lot of changes happening with that team. But if I was to pick, you know, um, I still think it's going to be it's going to be Pittsburgh or Baltimore. I think on top of this year. Oh, so you're you're saying the Bengals aren't. No, I no, I don't see them don't see them doing but you know I said the same thing last year too and uh and the Bengals uh, proved me wrong a little bit again so but you know I mad mad respect for Andy Dalton Dalton is really coming into his own as the quarterback there for for uh uh the Bengals Sorry about the the baby oh, there it's, it's okay Mine, uh, every time I do one of these, mine decides to do the thing where she 
because the dog is very attached to me, so I have to put him right outside my door, and so she wants to decide to play with him. She plays right outside my door, and you can hear her <laughs> banging up against the door every time to bug him. So uh, I get my fair share of her either coming in and interrupting during or, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Uh, so what do you think is a I, – I mean, you kind of said – you're expecting them to either be at the top or in that second spot. Well, what do you think is a realistic best case scenario for the Ravens? And what do you think is a worst case for them? Well, you know, you take a look at um, the first half for the Ravens, you know, first week one through seven. And you look, yeah, the bills are going to be a little bit of a um, tough then I shouldn't say tough game for the Bills, but it, it'll be there. Um, I see them going probably. I hate to say it, I'm sorry to Randy, but I see them going five and two, um, maybe six and one. You, you see, we play the Browns, we play the Jags, we play Oakland, and trust me, I would love to see the uh, the. Um, change between the Oakland game last year. That was a tough game to watch the Ravens fans. So, um, and then you get finally in after week nine. So you see the Steelers twice. You see the Bengals twice. Uh, you'll see the Browns again. Miami, New England. Uh, the New England game being a uh, uh, primetime game. Uh, so you're looking. Uh, I really can see them going... Nine and six, you know, or uh, nine and seven. Sorry, or uh, ten and six. So, a lot can happen. You know, it, it's like I've you, you know, were just saying. You know, the AFC North is very unpredictable, and and it's always a dogfight between all the games. So, well, I'm gonna have to make you do a little bit of predicting here. So, give me your full standings for the. Oh. You know, and I haven't really looked at all of the games um, for the other teams in the division. You know, we are seeing the uh, NFC, you know, with the Giants and Washington this year. The two East. Yeah, like. yeah. so um, I can see it's probably going to be, like I said, I put I would put the Baltimore probably 10-6. and six. Um, and I can also see the Steelers ten and six. Um, well, who wins that tiebreaker then? I, you know, sorry, sorry, Mike, but uh, Ravens are gonna take both games again this year. So, um, I know he'll he'll have an opinion about that a little bit later when you chat with him. But uh, uh, I, I really think uh, I think the Ravens will pull this one out this year. They, they have something to prove after. The uh, four-win record last year, you know, I, I think they have a lot to prove, especially where they were so close in games. We got to stay healthy. So, uh, for me, it's going to be Baltimore up there at ten and six. Um, first, Steelers probably ten and six. Uh, Cincinnati, I see eight and eight, and then Cleveland will be lucky if they get four wins this year. Do the Steelers get the wild card or? I would say so. I would really say so. But uh, like I saw this morning, you know, I read an article this morning talking about the AFC South and how they think they're going to be moving up, you know, with the Colts and all that. And uh, Jacksonville getting a little bit better. I see – I still see it coming, uh, the extra – the – wild card coming out of our division you know i'm interested to see what happens with um new england you know the first four games finally tom brady not <laughs> finally giving up on his stuff and uh uh gonna take the suspension so kind of interested to see what happens with them those first uh few games so i think that division i think uh the jets have got a good chance of getting getting up in that division all right well robert you uh have answered all of our questions here today uh, i want to say thank you as always for helping us out 
Hey, not a problem. I, I enjoy it. I uh, love talking football and especially Ravens football. Yes, uh, you have given us a, a ton on the Ravens, and I always appreciate it. I, I, I know who to go for my uh, Ravens information. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it'll be interesting. So let's try to make sure we chat it up, you know, the week before Thanksgiving as we uh, play the Cowboys. i um, kind of excited about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you and Mike – got to be on for when we have Steelers and Ravens too you know yep yep uh that'll be week nine and uh and then you know we play Randy's team uh the week before uh Halloween so that's going to be interesting too so can't wait all right Robert all right well uh he had a ton to say as usual about those Ravens and uh he had an interesting take Winning this division, the Ravens. You know, you said he answered a lot of questions. I have a question for Robert. He has said that all of his Cowboys friends, he, he's made bets with. But he's afraid to make a bet with the Jets fan. Ah. No <laughs> bets have been offered my direction for any kind of a dinner. This needs to be fixed. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, there you go, uh, Robert. When you listen back, you know you got to give yeah. Randy a dinner offer here. No, make sure there's plenty of lobster. So. Damn, man, the expensive stuff, huh? Oh yeah, get fancy. Uh, now, well, if you know, besides you know talking uh, fancy food, let's talk about how fancy this Ravens team is going to be. And I don't know. Um, they made some good additions in the off season. I'll say that, and he, he kind of mentioned a few of them. And I honestly feel like, uh, you know, you've got some pieces here that could definitely help them. I, I know they are really deep at running back. He kind of named off the running backs. I really think there's three that are solid enough to really stick around. That's Allen, Forsett, and uh, Kenneth Dixon, which is a great prospect. Uh, they are going to love him. Um, I feel like, you know, the receiving core is fine here. Um, I've always enjoyed watching, of course, Steve Smith play. Uh, Kamar Aiken does a great job as well. Uh, so, you know, as long as Joe Flacco can stay healthy, can put himself in the right situations, I really feel like their offense is not going to have any problems. It's their defense I get a little bit more concerned about at times. Uh, but, you know, injuries really did hurt their defense last year. So that wasn't the Ra- Ravens defense that, you know, you've seen. Uh, especially not the ones you've seen in years past, but I just think that injuries played this entire team last year, and so we didn't get this chance to see the Ravens team that we once knew. Um, but I, I just I do enjoy seeing the additions they made. They they did matter. Yeah, absolutely. I think the Ravens, to me, going into the season, are one of the tougher ones to figure out because of all the injuries they had last year. You know, they made a few good moves. Uh, I, I actually like the Mike Wallace signing. Uh, I know he, he wasn't much for Minnesota, but in the, the Baltimore offense, I really think that he can make a bit of an impact. I also like them picking up Benjamin Watson, the tight end from uh, New Orleans. Uh, Flacco, I think, will lean heavily on him. Uh, so I like some of the additions they made, but the bigger thing is these guys are going to be coming back healthy. We'll see if they stay healthy or not. I mean, that's the question every NFL team is going to have to make. But the team is good, and I, I'm with Robert where I think it's going to be that old-school three-headed monster that this division is known for. And really, you find yourself a, a three-sided die or whatever you need to to figure out who's going to win it because it, they're all going to be within a game or two of each other. Oh, for sure. And I mean, as we talked about, you know, the offense was already okay, even mm-hmm. with uh, the injuries on the other side. They were always competing, always close in games. I don't know how many games we did last year where it was either you or I talking about, my God, look, if this one thing happens, the, the Ravens win that game. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, so many close games with half of their roster. So you get the roster back and you, you turn the, those tables just a little bit. And I mean, this team could go from what they finished last year. They finished five and 11 to getting a buy really. If everything kind of worked out their way. Oh yeah. And I mean, they improved the running back core, improved the receiving core. Uh, you know, you get Terrell Suggs back, you get Eric, that's signing Eric Weddle. If he's, 
anything like he was in San Diego, that's a huge get for them. He's mm-hmm. going to basically write the rest of that defense. He's a he's a captain for sure. I mean, just, you know, they, like you said, they could be major players here. Mm-hmm. Um, they, this is going to be tough for the Bengals or for the Steelers uh, going forward. This is, this is not going to be the team they played last year if everybody kind of stays healthy. So. Yeah, so so we talked about the running backs a little bit. So, Gary, I'll ask you this question. Over or under August 20th when Trent Richardson gets cut? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll take the over on that. I think, yeah. You think he's staying? Oh, excuse me. I'm, I don't know what I'm thinking. Under. Uh, he's going to get cut. No, I, I believe he's getting cut. I don't. I don't see that this guy is going to come in here and all of a sudden put on a Ravens uniform and turn into uh, his collegiate self. How many did they got on the roster? Like seven. They got six right now. Well, five and Trent Richardson, which I don't count him. I think they no. had five last year because you know Talia, uh, Talia Farrell got hurt for the whole year, so he got put on IR. So I'd imagine they have to drop another one. Actually, I mean, technically they have seven running backs if you count their fullback, whose name I will not pronounce. Sick. <laughs> but yeah. Well, eight I mean, eight letters, one vowel. Good grief. Yeah. Oof. All right. Well, uh, you'll have to wait till the end of these things to get our full standings, but we'll go on with the Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, former, or I guess he's still... Sort of is. I don't know if he is or not. Uh, Full one rider Steve Cook. Uh, great uh, pal of Mr. Larry Zonka over there and a uh, few others. Uh, now writes for a blog, which I'll let you him let him uh, tell you himself. And uh, also does a fantasy football podcast. So here we go. Steve Cook talking Cincinnati Bengals. Hello. And I am here with... Steve Cook, longtime guy uh, with me at com, And, of course, he writes the Ultimate Sports blog as well and uh, even does a fantasy football podcast. Uh, how are you doing today, Steve? I'm doing great, Sean. Good to be here. We're finally getting close to football season. And thank God, man, because I – well, baseball season's over here in Cincinnati and we need something else to do. I need to watch something on TV other than, like, Trump. (laughs) Yes, uh, anything better than Trump at this point. Uh, (laughs) So, I mean, your Bengals, uh, they got to the playoffs, did well, lost Andy Dalton there, and still did pretty admirably for not having their uh, quarterback who improved by leaps and bounds last year. What do you think of... Dalton, and do you think this year he's primed to be even better? I like I like Andy Dalton. He's gotten better each and every year. There have been a large portion of Bengals fans that were not exactly sold on Dan, uh, sold on Andy. Not quite sure he's the guy to get them over the hump. He was kind of a game manager his first couple of years, which is fine when you're a rookie just starting out. Doesn't quite have the flashiness of Cam Newton or you know the the crazy stats of an Andrew Luck or somebody like that. He's just kind of, uh, he's a good, solid quarterback, and that should be, that's enough to get it done usually. And But, you know, we always want more. And people kind of fell in love fell in love with A.J. McCarron, you know, the quarterback out of Alabama, uh, Catherine Webb, husband, good stuff, good times there. And people were excited <laughs> about McCarron a little bit. And it was the best of both roles for the Bengals last year in that we did get to see A.J. McCarron. And he performed pretty well. I, I, he had a couple slip-ups, obviously. Uh, the, the end of the Broncos game didn't go so well. But he kept them in that Broncos game. He did his best in the Steelers game. Almost got them the win there. So he did well. People were excited with him. But even better than that was Andy Dalton stepped his game up to the next level. Became uh, one, of the, one of the better quarterbacks. I don't, I'm bad at ra- ranking guys, quite frankly. I don't know if he's like a top 10 kind of guy, but he, I think he had numbers of a top 10 guy last year before he got hurt. So that definitely improved by leaps and bounds looking good. I got, I got good hopes for him this season. Uh, he's still got AJ green. I think we'll probably, we'll probably touch on a little bit later. Uh, man, missing a couple of guys, a wide receiver, but wide re- 
wide receivers other than than Green have always been kind of a question mark anyway. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because you you did lose uh, two of your uh, big wide receivers that you had been kind of relying on the side from A.J. Green. Uh, so you did get Tyler Boyd at the draft to kind of sort of replace at least one of them, and you still got Tyler Eifert, even though he had some injury concerns last year. Are you worried about that at all with with Eifert's uh, longevity? I do worry about Eifert's injury concerns. He it seems like he misses time every single year due to some kind of injury. When he is on the field, he's he's been pretty good. He he also stepped his game up notch last year. It looked fantastic when he was on the field. Had some problems staying on the field, so longevity is a bit of a concern. If he can stay healthy, they don't, you know, he's their second option behind A.J. Green, no doubt. Uh, Marvin Jones, in, inconsistent, I would say. He had some big games. I remember he scored four touchdowns in a game like Al Bundy. He had some really big games last year, too. And there are games where he wasn't really a factor, games where he just wasn't wasn't a thing. And, I mean, good luck to him in, in Detroit. I don't think I would give him the contract that Detroit gave him, so more power to him. Mohamed Sanu, I miss a little bit more than Marvin Jones because he was a guy who could uh, he could do more than just catch the ball. He was he was actually a, a quarterback back in his college days, and one of the favorite plays was to do the old flea flicker with him throwing the ball. And I think he had a perfect quarterback right in there for a while. I think he missed a pass eventually, but so those are always fun. Gonna miss having him out there, but uh, you know we got we'll see what happens with the rookie Boyd. I haven't seen much of him outside Pittsburgh games against Louisville. He tended to do pretty good in those. Uh, we brought in, we got uh, Brand LaFell, you know, longtime uh, Patriot, kind of bounced around. We'll see uh, I th- We'll see where he, what he does. Hopefully he does better than some of these other wide receivers that just kind of come in and wind up doing nothing. But I, I, I got hope, and, and whoever it is, they'll be able to get, uh, they won't have too much coverage because people will be focusing on AJ and Tyler Reifert. So whoever's out in that, position should be able to do something if they have anything anybody in free agency or you know the draft aside from boy that we've talked about i mean william jackson was the third was one of the the big like a surprise kind of pick because everybody expected him to take a receiver there well i have the Bengals love taking cornerbacks in the first round it's been kind of the thing all throughout marvin lewis's tenure we got leon hall in the first round Jonathan Joseph, uh, still still a guy in the league. Uh, we sometimes they don't work out. Like we got uh, Darquez Denard hadn't done a whole lot yet. We'll see. Maybe he'll do something eventually. Uh, Drake Kirkpatrick seemed like he's gonna be a bust for a while. He did some good stuff last year. Still kind of a wait and see kind of guy. And you know, hell, Pacman Jones wasn't a first round pick by us, but he was a first round pick in the league. So the, I wasn't surprised at all. They went with the cornerback and. Everything I've seen about the everything I've seen about uh, Johnson there looks like he's a top notch guy. Went to Houston, had some big games against some top competition there. Houston, maybe an American Athletic Conference school. They played some legit schools now. They played Florida State, played Louisville. So, you know, he's a he's could a good be, solid uh, talent. It seems could be part of the Big Twelve soon. Yeah, that could quite possibly could be along with the Cincinnati Bearcats. We'll see how it goes. They might might be a Big Twelve, a Big Fourteen. Who knows? Who knows? But are are you uh, expecting? Are you excited about maybe Cincinnati becoming a, a Big Twelve? Well, team? I'm a Louisville guy, so I don't care about. Ah, UC. that's right. I forgot yeah. you were. Uh, so I, I was glad that when Louisville got the ACC invite over UC, so I was pretty happy about that. And I do feel bad for UC fans though, because they're kind of languishing in the American, trying to get excited for games against like Tulane and Tulsa and teams like that. Just you know, then. Doesn't get people all excited for sure, and the, it seems like the program's kind of gone down a notch too. They they have a good offense. Their defense has not been good last couple of years. Tommy Tuberville probably needs to get things going this year, or who, I don't know what his long term future is there. But I know UC's hoping to get out of that American Athletic Conference. I was glad Louisville only had one year in it. That's for sure. Uh, excited about that ACC network. You get to see more of Louisville. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's going to be uh, that means a lot more money for the ACC, which definitely everything definitely college sports needs more money, right? They just don't have enough yeah. money. Those yeah. those poor schools, man, they just uh they just don't have enough money flowing in college sports. The NCAA, they're a bunch of paupers over there, man or oh man. But hey, the games are fun, you know? 
Exactly. You just you gotta know, ignore and... everything that happens off the field, and I mean everything that happens <laughs> off the field, because nothing good happens off the field in college sports. No. Ridiculous. <laughs> But, uh, I mean, looking at especially the way the Bengals had the season they had last year, you have to have, I guess, the similar expectations, maybe even Super Bowl expectations for um, them this well, year. Well, last year I predicted that the Bengals would go to the playoffs and lose in the first round. The year before that I predicted the Bengals would go to the playoffs and lose in the first round. The year before that, I think you <laughs> maybe pick up on a trend there. It's been the trend for the Bengals the last few years here. They have a good regular season. They, I, they they had their best regular season in a while last year. So they have a good regular season. They go into the playoffs. They get all excited. And sure enough, uh, once we hit the first round, Marvin Lewis turns to a big old pumpkin, and the Bengals end up out out after one game. And uh, <laughs> certainly the way it ended last year, probably the worst of them all, certainly because it came at the hands of the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Bengals' rival, and uh, not only just because of that, but because of the way they managed to lose. The way they melted down in the last seconds of that game, committed some silly penalties, and pretty much gift-wrapped the thing for the Steelers. But was I surprised by it when I was watching it? No, because I was just waiting the whole time for the other shoe to drop. How are the Bengals going to screw it up this time? And they didn't let me down in that regard. They, just, they managed to screw it up, gift-wrapped the game for the Steelers, and unfortunately, and I hear people, I hear a lot of good buzz about the Bengals this year. I hear people saying, well, may the Bengals are the team to beat in the AFC. I've heard people say that. And, you know, great roster. I won't sell anybody short on the roster. But they have to win a playoff game before I say they're the team to beat or before I say they're going to even make a run in the playoffs. you got to win one game first before you, win, before you sell on me on it. So you're not willing to be, go out there and go, this is the year they finally do it? No. no, I wish I could. I wish I could, but as a longtime Bengals fan, you have to remember, us, us Bengals fans, we went through the 1990s, a decade where the Bengals mostly won three games a year. That whole decade was pretty much crappy football after crappy football after crappy football, and that kind of beats you down into a place where you know you don't expect a whole lot from these guys. Because you've seen them fail time and time again. And during the Marvin Lewis, Lewis era, it is long enough to be an era these days. I mean, Marvin Lewis, he, he is the is he the longest tenured or is it Belichick? It's Belichick, well, right? Belichick is the longest, he, but he's second. Lewis is second, yeah. He's been there. He's been there a little, He was there back in the uh, first Bush administration, so that kind of tells you how long he's been there. And he's had a good run there for the most part. I, they've, had, I, they've had the majority of winning seasons. He's got the best record in Bengals coaching history. Uh, you know, Mike Brown's happy with him. They, I think he'll be there as long as he wants to be. But the guy just, he hasn't won a playoff game, man. <laughs> he's, he, I think, he, I'm pretty sure he's a guy who's lost more playoff games without winning one. I think he passed Jim Moore for that a year or two ago. So at some point, man, he's got to get done in the playoffs. Otherwise, it's just, you know, it's, it's not good. But like I said, as a Bengals fan, I fully expect him to not get done because that's all I know. The Bengals won a playoff game back in uh, late 1990. No, I think it's I think it's 91. Like you know, it was, it was in the 1991 playoffs, and they beat the Houston Oilers. Remember the Houston Oilers? That was the team. Yeah. They, and then they went on the next week to lose to the Los Angeles Raiders. If you remember the Los Angeles Raiders, that was also a football team. <laughs> well, now Los Angeles actually the team again. Yeah. Then that was the game. Bro, Bo Jackson broke his hip. And, uh, you know, ever since then, the Bengals have been uh, been cursed by Bo Jackson. <laughs> the Bo the Jackson play- curse. That's right. They have not won a playoff game since then. And uh, hopefully the Bo Jackson curse and one of those things that lasts as long as Bo Jackson's alive. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be good for us because I think he's still got a good 20, 30 years left, at least. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hope not for the Bengals. Uh, I mean, so looking at the – where do you, what do you assess with the other teams in, in your division? Um. The Browns have a new head coach, Hugh Jackson, smart guy. He came came from the Bengals, offense coordinator, good scheme guy. I, I'm a big fan of Hugh. He was on. He impressed me on the Hard Knock show. Seems like a good guy. Gets along with players. I don't expect him to win in Cleveland because it is Cleveland. It is the Browns. It's a tough situation. So I don't consider them contending for anything. If they do, 
If they do, I mean, it'll be a sure sign hell's freezing over because I know the Cavaliers won a title this year. Indians looking pretty good in baseball, but I don't think the Browns are going to make it three for three. I just don't see them doing much of anything. As far as the Ravens go, they had a down year last year. Uh, they're, you know, most of their guys that you know as Baltimore Ravens are gone now because they're old and retired or they went somewhere else or whatever the case may be. Most of their payroll sunk in Joe Flacco means they just it's tough to kind of build a team around that. And uh, I think they'll be a little bit better this year. But at the end of the day, it's going to come down to the Bengals and it's going to come down to those Pittsburgh Steelers. And as much as I like to dump on the Steelers, and, you know, their defense might not be what it was in the glory days. Their offense is better, though. I mean, they got Antonio Brown. They got Le'Veon Bell. Ben Roethlisberger, you can't sell that guy short. So they got one of the better offenses in base, in football, I think. And so it'll come down to them. And as much as I hate to admit it, I'm going to take the Steelers win the division because I don't want to get my hopes up, and hopefully it'll jinx them. <laughs> That's what I'm hoping for, you know, the old reverse jinx. I'm going to pick the Steelers to win and hope they fall short. So, I mean, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll need Le'Veon Bell to get suspended or something. You know, he, he's good for one, one of those years. So. you got to have and D'Angelo Williams get hurt, too. Yeah, D'Angelo Williams has to get hurt. We'll have to see uh, Landry Jones show up at some point on the uh, <laughs> under center for the Steelers because Roethlisberger tends to miss a game or two. So if we can catch him uh, in one of those weeks, who knows? But uh, – I think the Steel, while Steelers and Bengals both made the, both make the playoffs, it's going to be close either way. It'll be like 11, 5, 10, 6 or something like that. And they'll both be dangerous teams heading to the playoffs, except, you know, the Steelers tend to get more dangerous in the playoffs. I mean, Bengals don't. <laughs> I can't argue with that, honestly. Uh, so give me a, what do you think is a realistic best case scenario for the Bengals and a worst case scenario for the Bengals? Okay, let's see. Where's the best case scenario? I'm just going to take a quick look at the schedule. Let's see. I I see the Jets in week one, Steelers in week two. Um, Best case scenario there is they win one. Week two in Pittsburgh is going to be tough. I don't know. People will be missing Vontaze perfect for that game. But I actually think, and if I've heard people say it, that might actually be a good thing because he won't do something stupid. So without yeah, perfect, they're not losing some more games. <laughs> without perfect, they're do something stupid. I think they might actually have a chance to sneak away with that game. You got Broncos, Dolphins, Cowboys at Patriots. Of course, Tom Brady will be back. That's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Browns and Browns and Redskins. I think best case scenario there, I could see them going maybe six and six and two before the bye, which would be a good start. Put them right in playoff contention. Worst case, I could see them going. Well, I mean. You lose the Iceland Steelers, Broncos. I mean, you know, Broncos won't be as good. I could see, honestly, I think the worst case would probably be three and five. Three and five seems like the worst case to me, and that's if a lot of things go wrong. Because a lot of those teams look beatable. Of course, the Reds, the Redskins at 930 London game, so that could, that could really go either way. I'm not sure if I trust the Bengals flying out to London. That could be a dangerous time right there. But then they get the bye after that. Last eight games of the season, you got two Ravens games, got the Steelers week 15, another Browns, Bills, Giants, Ravens. So I'm going to say their best case scenario, I could see them win 12 games. I could see them going 12 and 4. That might not, that might not, might, as I can, I can, as I spit all over myself, that might not be enough to get by though. I mean, they didn't get by last year in the AFC. I know that the Broncos are going to be down. The Patriots will still be fine. Uh, the Colts should be better this year if Andrew Luck stays healthy. Of course, the Steelers are Steelers. That's still, if you get 12-4, and four, that still might have you playing in the first round, which would be a bad time. The best-case scenario is for Bengals to get by in the first round. So at least they get to the conference uh, semifinals. That would be nice. Then maybe they can. Maybe once they get past the first round game by not playing it, that's how they win. That, <laughs> that seems like that might be the that might be how that works right there. But I think we're at best case is twelve and four, maybe thirteen three if they go crazy. And then your worst case scenario, honestly, uh, I can't see them doing worse than eight and eight unless like a ton of guys get hurt. Yeah, you know Dalton Green, like Jeremy Hill and Bernard. You miss key guys on defense. Uh, I, I just can't see them doing worse than eight and eight. I could see nine and seven. That could be. And they could then be, end up being a wild card team there. But 
It's kind of good when your worst case scenario is you can think of as eight and eight. So I know it's kind of a first world problem, but I still am bitter about the whole playoff thing. Uh, do not blame you. Uh, I mean, we're as as a Cowboys fan, we're starting to go through that now with uh, them not doing a whole lot, or you know, expectations, and then one thing goes wrong, and everything else does. So, yeah, I mean, I know they're expecting. I know they got Ezekiel Elliott. I know they're expecting a lot from him this year. I see Ezekiel Elliott. He's going like in top fives of fantasy drafts, which I mean, I don't know. That seems high to me, but who knows. It seems high to me too, but you know, if they're really going to commit to the run, I guess it's not a not a bad thing. No. But uh, Steve, uh, you've answered all of our questions here. I want to thank you for helping us out. Hey, no problem. I bet I bet am I one of the more negative people that you probably had do this? You got like a lot of homers on these shows, or how does that usually uh, go? We get we actually get <laughs> uh, you know a nice mixture. I had a, you know, when I had the Browns fan on, he was like, uh, I know we're going to be in the bottom, and I almost hope we are so we can get some more draft picks. So, yeah. I mean. Uh, well, they're it, happier now. They, they got the Cavs win, so they're happier now. Right, yeah. So they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, that, that stigma of not, not winning for however long. Uh, but uh, hopefully, you know, we can have you on to, to break down some, some of those Bengal, big Bengals games during the season or. Or whatever. So well, that's what that's what you hope that there's big that there are big Bengals games or whoever your team is. That's what you hope is that they have big games, and they're not playing you know sad games at the end of the year. Nobody cares about. True. Well, uh, any plugs you want to make here before we? Well, I got to plug all my stuff. I got to plug my buddy uh, Dustin James, other four four one one legend. There, the ultimate sports blog dot com is where you go. You got him. You got another 411 guy, Jeremy Lambert. He's doing his thing there as well. I do a weekly baseball column there. I, it's uh, the USB Baseball Report. It's a good time. I mean, I am kind of running out of things to write about because the Reds are god-awful. But I, I'm powering through it. And we also, of course, got the uh, got the offtheteam.com. We got the uh, – it'll be coming back here in August once the season starts up. The Ocho off the team dot com fantasy football podcast, where you can go to get all your information on fantasy football from me and the Voodoo Penguin. We know our stuff, man. We've been doing that fantasy football thing for a while now. I win some titles. He he doesn't really, but he he's still a pretty smart guy. So we know what we're doing there. And hey, if you want to hear, if you want to read some wrestling stuff, I actually read a couple wrestling things over at the, the uh, Ultimate Sports Blog dot com too. So yeah, I do well, that occasionally. Well, you know, uh, I think probably the the thing people are most wondering about is is when that top 100 column is going to show up again. Oh yeah, the hot 100. Unfortunately, I re- I retired from that one, and I don't know if they brought it back or not. I'm assuming they probably didn't. But. No, no, but no, I I kind of sat out from that, and you know, I think it's a good thing that the women's division is actually getting some run now, and the ladies are getting some respect for that. So I'm I'm glad. And I would have a tough. It'd be tough for me to do something like try to rank Bailey, because she's just so cute, you know. And you know, you just want to give her a big hug. I don't feel comfortable like saying how hot she is compared to Sasha Banks or something like that. You know, it's just I don't know. I'm, I'm just, man, I'm just getting old. You know, it's, and it seems weird. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we all get there. So, thank you, Mr. Cook, again for helping us out, and uh, you have a good one. Thank. you. All right, that was the uh, very colorful Steve Cook uh, talking about uh, Cincinnati Bengals. Uh, there was points where I had to mute myself because I was hysterically laughing. Uh, but uh, <laughs> guys, he pretty much uh, gave you a good assessment of the Bengals. He talked about the playoffs a lot. I <laughs> think he's better. Just a little. Playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I need to have that Jim Moore cliff ready to go. <laughs> Isn't it? Uh, Cincinnati was one of the best teams in the league last year before Andy Dalton went down. What were they, 10-2 and two when he went down? And they should have won that playoff game against Pittsburgh before everyone lost their damn minds. And just, they, it just completely fell apart. I, I guess you can say they bingled it. Uh, 
but I do think that they probably are the favorites to win this division, and I'm with him. I think they have a decent shot at getting the bye with the the Broncos being down and the Patriots losing Brady for the first four games. There's not a lot of like top-notch teams right now in the AFC. There's a lot of pretty good teams, and it's going to be really interesting, but the Bengals have a decent shot of, of getting that bye week, and that's even after they have to play my Jets week one. And uh, just so you know, the Jets have not lost a week one matchup in their last five. So after you guys start 0-1, you, you, you guys can get things turned around a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I kind of look at this and uh, I kind of think to myself, you know, how much have they really changed? They lost some, you know, some pretty uh, some pretty good receivers, let's be honest. I mean, some guys that really had helped them for a long time and now they're kind of revamping that. They're trying to, you know, come up with some new things. But I think that's a nice thing, actually. If you ask me, sometimes when you're forced into change, it's better for you. And I think that's something they're going to be dealing with, you know, I, I'm not a big, you know, red ball guy. He, Andy Dalton's fine. He, he's doing better uh, than I ever gave him credit for. I was not a big guy on him, but last year he really kind of proved me wrong. His injury really hurt the team in the, those playoffs. Uh, but you know, we're not even getting close to playoffs. We're right now we're trying to get the season started and, and figure that out. And at this point, as we sit here. I think the Bengals are in a decent shape. I think you're talking about the schedule. I think you talk about some of the talent level. I still think they got a lot of those things working for them. And I, I really just think, you know, they're going to be similar to what they were last year. Maybe not completely the same team, but I, I think very similar. And actually, uh, Sean, you know, Gary brings up the wide receivers and all the changes they have there. We'll see if LaFell can remember how to catch. He kind of lost that ability at the end of the year with the Patriots. And we'll see how Tyler Boyd does. But my bigger question for you is, what about their running game? Because, I mean, I know last year everyone was super high on them with Jeremy Hill and Bernard. But I'll ask you, how many 100-yard rushers did they have last year? Like, one very many. I'd say like two or three. There was one. It was Bernard rushed for 123 yards back in week two. No one else the entire season ran for 100 yards in a game. Now, a lot of that is because they are splitting it back and forth. But do you think their focus will be more on getting Hill and Bernard going a bit more since the, some of their wide receivers are gone? Yeah, I mean, that would seem to be the thing you would do is go with your strengths. And you got two wide receivers, and especially now you can rely more on Hill. And maybe you put Giovanni Bernard out there uh, in the flat or – out there as a receiver a little bit more uh, to kind of soften the blow of not having the the receivers you sort of relied on before. You know A.J. Green's going to get that double coverage. Not that they have bad receivers. You know, Tyler Ford could certainly fill the role of uh, Marvin Jones or Mohamed Sanu uh, quite easily. But I think uh, it, that's, a, that's a dual threat you can use and use more often. Uh, you, we don't know about Eifer. We know he's great when he's on the field. Is he going to be injured again? Because that seems to be an mm-hmm. issue he has. And the defense is going to be as stacked as usual now. They're going to be missing Reggie Nelson. He was huge for them last year. Uh, it's, how much is, is that going to hurt? Um, you know, it's some issues, some guys missing. I think that they might. This is where I think the Steelers might go above them this year uh, because of some of the key losses that they have, and you have to work out some of the kinks. I think they might still nab that wild card, but... You know, it's going to be a big, big race, and it comes when it's, when you're missing those some of those key guys you had last year. That can make all the difference when it's that close, and that's why I'm thinking maybe maybe the Bengals aren't necessarily the favorite. So uh, last but surely not least, uh, he helps us out a lot, and um, and he's going to be helping out Randy pretty soon too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we got to Mr. Michael Mitchell talking Pittsburgh Steelers. Hello, and I am here with a friend of the show. We've had him on several times, usually talking Pittsburgh Steelers. Mr. Mike Mitchell, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Sean. How are you doing? Doing good. Just got off work and... 
just uh, trying to relax, I guess, now. So, let's start with, I mean, the Steelers, you know, they made the miracle run to the playoffs, thanks to some help from, you know, Randy's Jets, and a few, you know, wins on their part as well, and then, you know, they, they eventually lost, they go into the off season, and they do their thing with free agency and, and the draft. I mean, what did you think of their off season? I thought their off season addressed their major needs. Uh, I believe last time we talked in recapping their season, you know, their primary need with the retirement of Heath Miller was to pick up a tight end, which I believe I had mentioned at the time, I didn't feel like they would draft one and they found one in free agency that hopefully has a lot of potential, you know, Ladarius green, is uh, <clears throat> is a guy that he, he brings a different dynamic to the team. And he doesn't do the rugged stuff as well as Heath Miller did as far as you know run blocking and pass protection. But he has a dynamic playmaking ability from the tight end position. You know, when you factor in Antonio Brown last season getting 194 targets, which was more than double any other stealer, he's going to have opportunities to make plays because, you know, teams are going to double Brown which creates more opportunities for everybody else. Uh, And again, the Steelers drafted uh, needs a defense. I don't know if you knew this, but they've spent seven of their last eight first and second round draft picks on the defensive side of the ball. So again, they have been making, you know, taking the necessary steps to patch up uh, suspect defense over the last couple seasons. Yeah, I mean... So, anybody in the draft that, like, you're really looking at that you liked? I like Artie Burns. Um, You know, cornerback has been the weakest position for the Steelers the last couple seasons. You know, they they bring Gay back, and Gay is a, he's he's a decent corner, so I think he'll be be solid on that side. But, you know, on the other side, you've got uh, Russ Cockrell, who, you know, Ross... He's he's a serviceable player, but he's he isn't dynamic by any stretch. So, you know, I think Burns will have his chance at some point, you know, in the preseason even to prove that he should uh, have an opportunity to start the season. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, they had some improvements when some guys had to go down, like uh, you know, Cockrell showed up for them really last year. So, adding Artie Burns is going to be. I think a terrific thing for the Steelers just improving that defense. And like you said, that's kind of been their issue. So hopefully he works out for them. So we go on to going into the this training camp that's about to start here pretty soon. What do you think, what do you feel like having your ear to, I guess, what the coaches are saying and everything? What do you feel like are the expectations? You as a, as a fan, what do you see with the Steelers this year. Obviously, you know, looking at the division, it seems like maybe it's a little less stacked than it has been. Or oh, you that, that pay attention to it more than, than we do, what do you think about the division and just the expectation of the Steelers in that division? Well, I think, <clears throat> you know, the Steelers' expectations are, are, are Super Bowl this season, you know, but... That's that's determined on the fact that even with the loss of Martavis Bryant again to smoking weed again, uh, they still feel like they have enough weapons on the offensive side to you know make a serious run into the postseason and possibly you know the title. The question marks obviously you have uh, Le'Veon Bell returning from another season-ending injury. So can he stay on the field? When he's on the field, that offense is as good an offense as any team in the NFL. And, you know, he makes defenses have to be honest, which creates more opportunities for guys like Antonio Brown and, you know, guys like Marcus Wheaton who get another chance this season because of of Bryant's suspension. You know, Wheaton gets his opportunity to be the number two the entire season this year. So he gets, you know, more chances himself plus Ladarius Green at tight end. You know, these guys all, it it all kind of hinges, in my opinion, on whether or not Bell stays healthy. And and obviously, you know, can Big Ben stay on the field? 
you know, I've uh, I saw that Big Ben lost 15 pounds coming into this off season, so we'll see if that helps him. You know, if that translates to positive things for him staying on the field more. So that's on the offensive side. You know, the pieces are all there. Can they stay healthy? On the defensive side, you know, what kind of growth will they get out of their, their younger? Well, I was going to ask you before you went to into the defense. I was reading somewhere that it seemed like they're going to do more of a one-two punch with D'Angelo Williams and, and Le'Veon Bell this year. Do you think that helps with Le'Veon Bell staying on the field then? Well, sure. I mean, obviously, the less wear and tear you have, the the more chance you have of staying on the field. And not only that, you know, there's there's whispers of even some two back sets, which would be kind of interesting to see. But you know, it's it's a possibility. You know, I think if that offense really wants to open things up, which the Steelers have had some unique sets in the past, and they they definitely aren't aren't afraid to take some uh, some chances on the offensive side of the ball would be kind of interesting to see if they do run any two-back sets with Bell and Williams on the field at the same time. So, yeah, I, I definitely think uh, you know, Williams was was more than you could have ever hoped for last season for the majority of it until, of course, he got hurt you know, at the end of the season. But his durability was, was greater last season than it's been you know at almost any point in his career. So... By all means, use him when you can, and try and keep Bell on the field as much as you can, you know, in the in the long term. Yeah. So if you were getting to the defense, uh, I guess, in assessing what you think. Just obviously, the, the team's defense, who they drafted last year, and everything, uh, they improved. You know, James Harrison comes back. Seems like they're primed to be even better this year, then. Uh, I think a lot of, you know, the defense has been going through, you know, a transitional phase. And, you know, that, that just, it, part of it could be applied to the fact that they haven't gotten used to, you know, a new defensive coordinator. Uh, the system is still a base 3-4, but they, they you know, you have different, different <clears throat> game planning, different plays, you know, and, and ways to run things. So, you know, last season was a big transition for them. Everybody on that defense has another year under their belt together, you know, and they've plugged in a couple spots. You know, the the <clears throat> the, the safety position is probably the one spot where they might actually start a rookie because it looks like Sean Davis might be the favorite to take over at strong safety for the Steelers, which, you know, Mike Mitchell – has has been a, a pretty good f- uh, free safety, but the Steelers had a penchant for getting burned a lot last season on, on deep ball. So we'll see how Sean Davis does if he does, in fact, become the starting strong safety that could help them, you know, to not give up so many big plays. And like you said, James Harrison is coming back, which means that will probably create another timeshare for he and Jarvis Jones. Jarvis Jones is kind of in one of those situations where it's it's almost a you know put up or shut up season for him. You know, he either does it now or he does it never. I would be surprised if he's back with the Steelers next season if he doesn't show considerable improvement this year. So, what do you feel are the Steelers? I mean, you already said Super Bowl for the Steelers, so <laughs> you expect them to do well, obviously. But how do you look at this division? Uh, the AFC North in, in your eyes as a Steelers fan? Well, I think it's going to come down to the Steelers and Bengals again this season. <clears throat> um, and I have really been going back and forth as to who I like better out of those two teams. And, you know, head-to-head, obviously that plays a major role, but... I'm just going to kind of throw the Browns out of the picture for now for obvious reasons, you know, until until they prove otherwise, the Browns have been, you know, basically irrelevant in that division for a long time. You know, the Ravens had a ton of injuries last season. You know, they have question marks. Anybody, anytime someone comes back from an injury, they're a question mark automatically to start the next season. And you can't have a bigger question mark than a guy who tore his ACL at your quarterback position. So... I think the Ravens will certainly improve on last season. I can't see them having as many injuries as they had, but I don't think that they're going to get back to the level they were, say, three seasons ago. So it comes down to the Steelers and the Bengals, and 
looking at just the the schedule, the Cincinnati starts out with four of their first six games on the road against the Jets, Steelers, Cowboys, and Patriots. That's a pretty rough stretch of four four games there, you know. You know the the Jets just missed the playoffs. The Steelers and Patriots have been perennial powerhouses, and as long as Romo's on the field, the Cowboys are a threat. And you know, two two of those home games they have, one of them they're hosting Denver, so that's a pretty rough starting patch for them. But the Steelers don't have it a lot easier. They're on the road at the Redskins and the Ravens, which if you know you follow the Reds, uh, the Steelers Ravens rivalry, it doesn't matter how good or bad either of those teams are. They're all yeah, they're always a threat to beat each other. And then they host the Bengals, Chiefs, Jets, Patriots, and Cowboys. That's in the first half. So that's a pretty rough stretch of home games. At least they're hosting those games. But all five of those teams are playoff caliber teams. So I think the, the first half of the season will go a long ways towards deciding who wins the AFC North. <clears throat> and, you know, with as far as just going back to the Ravens real quick, you know, they end their season with three out of their four games on the road against New England, Pittsburgh, and Cincinnati. That's a pretty rough group of road games there to finish out the season. So I have, and like I said, I went back and forth on this. I have the Steelers at 11-5, and five, the Bengals at 10-6, and six, the Ravens at 8-8, eight and eight, and the Browns at 4-12. and 12. That's how I have the AFC North stacking up. So you have uh, the Steelers getting one of the wild cards then? No, I have them winning the division at 11. Or sorry, yeah. Right, and I have the Bengals at, at getting one of the wild cards. Give me a – well, you already told me your best case scenario is the Super Bowl, and you realistically think that that's they could get there. What to you, what to you is a worst case scenario, the worst thing you see them seeing happening for them? Worst case scenario is they lose uh, Big Ben or Le'Veon Bell again, you know. And you know, considering that they still managed to compete at a pretty high level even without Le'Veon Bell last season, you know, I think the the worst case scenario would be to lose uh, Ben Roethlisberger, just because you know the quarterback position, backup quarterbacks don't win Super Bowls. It just doesn't happen. You know, it's it may have happened once or twice in badly matched uh, Super Bowls. But, you know, backup quarterbacks just don't win in the NFL. So the, the worst-case scenario is, is is a rash of injuries to key positions, you know. And, like I said, the best-case scenario, and I think it's fair to say the Steelers are, are, are a, a threat to, to make the Super Bowl this year. Best-case scenario is they, they stay healthy and they do win the Super Bowl. But... You know, as we all know, Tom Brady's suspended for four years, but New England has has been the team to beat in the AFC for much of the past, you know, fifteen years really. So you know, the Steelers will face New England in week seven this, this year and it'll be interesting to see how they stack up. Brady will have three games under his belt and be back. So I'm kinda of looking at that game as a good gauge as to how the Steelers match up with the you know the team that tends to represent <clears throat> the AFC most frequently. You know, obviously Denver won last season, but I still think New England is probably the cream of the crop, so we'll see how Pittsburgh matches up there. What is a name that you think, and not a lot of people are talking about right now, but it's going to be maybe a stand-up for the, the Steelers? Well, as far as uh, <clears throat> standouts go, I think Ladarius Green is the obvious choice because his his style at tight end is so much different from Heath Miller's that it's going to it's going to, in my opinion, kind of complete the transition of the Steelers being a wide open offense. You know, Heath Miller was was a, a great tight end, and the things he did were more conventional to you know the rough and tough versions of tight ends. But Ladarius Green gives gives them you know more playmaking ability. So I think he would be the standout uh, on the offensive side and on the defensive side. You know, I think it, it comes down to do Artie Burns or Sean Davis get their chance, and and how do they do? You know, how are those guys going to perform? They're both rookies. They both might have you know, wonderful opportunities to make a name for themselves this season. So those would be my two on the defensive side. 
All right, Mike. I think you answered all of our questions here. Just one quick addition real go fast. Ahead. The Steelers let Sean Sweejum go uh, this offseason and retained Chris Boswell. So from a uh, special teams perspective, you know, that's that's one major change. We all know Sweejum got hurt in the offseason. Boswell took over last season anyway. And they officially did let him go because he has a lower price tag, you know, essentially for equivalent ability. So. Yeah, I mean, he was great for him when he came in, so it, I expected they were going to keep him. That's good. And Heinz Field is an easy place to kick. And the thing is, Sweden was was very good, too, so it's kind of, you know, they went from the debacle that was their their kicking team last season to an embarrassment of riches in the off season. Uh, You know, that's the thing, too. So, I mean, speaking of kicking, do you like the – have you heard about the whole putting the microchips in the ball so they can see, like, what happens to the ball, how far it goes, and and all that, so that maybe they can narrow the goalpost? Are you in favor of making field goal kicks harder? <clears throat> well, I, I, I kind of like the microchip idea just because it's technology, and we all like to see new stuff, you know. The, the pylon cam was one of the greatest inventions in the history of the NFL, in my opinion. I mean, it, it, it completely gave you perspectives that we never had before. So I'm all for the idea of, of enhancing, you know, the gameplay and the things that we can learn about it. As for narrowing the goalposts, maybe. I mean, if you look at, you know, look, look at, you know, the... <clears throat> the the indoor teams don't have any weather issues whatsoever. So, you know, if you've got you've got a, a guy that that can kick from forty yards in, it's it's almost automatic anymore. You know, but you look at what happened in in last season's uh, extra point category and how many extra points were missed, and then it makes you kind of wonder: should they move the goalposts in? I mean, look at how many extra points we had last season that was never you know was unheard of and all of a sudden the extra point is no longer automatic so we'll see i think i think maybe give it a season see what sort of uh feedback you get and you know go from there all right i mean yeah good point there uh so mike i mean i don't uh we i don't know that we've officially announced we we've said it i think but we haven't officially announced the whole you guys doing the fantasy football podcast, you and Randy. So have you all come up with anything idea wise or anything you want to share with listeners or you want to just keep it under wraps until the debut? No, I, I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we haven't got the initial launching date down exactly, but it's looking like the middle of August. Uh, Randy Isbell and myself will be, We'll be doing a fantasy football podcast, and we will be giving uh, fantasy football advice. We'll be reviewing games. We'll be looking forward to upcoming matchups. You know, we'll also be doing a draft special you know, prior to the season starting. So we'll be going over all the positions and who we like, who we don't like. You know, booms and busts, guys to avoid. You know, guys to try and pick up. Uh, you know, late in the draft sleepers. So, yeah, I'm really excited for that. I think it's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun for us. And you know, the fact that he and I are both in a pretty competitive league together should make it kind of interesting. <laughs> yes, uh, we'll make sure to try to get you in the uh, the league for the podcast this year too, so we can have uh, everybody be competitive <laughs> between uh, between Randy, uh, yourself, you know, Robert. Because uh, he was in the league last year, and uh, Gary and I, so uh, should be fun. Yeah, I look forward to it. Absolutely, it's you know, it's it's hard to believe that preseason is just a little over two weeks away. It's I'm just glad it's here because uh, having to do the podcast like every week and finding things to talk about because, because there's nothing going on. Uh, yeah. It's completely understandable. I mean, you're you know we're getting to the point where you're going to go from nothing to talk about to everything to talk about. So I look forward to it, rubbing my hands together, and uh, 
Let's get ready. Yeah, okay. That was weird. I thought I pressed the button to actually start talking, and that didn't happen. Uh, well, Mike pretty much uh, sort of said what it seems like everyone's been saying between the Bengals and the Steelers. What do you guys think? You know, uh, the Steelers are a team that, you know, I look forward to watching this year because, you know, they did have the big suspension with Bryant. And then, of course, you know, the rest of that receiving core stays just as good as they were last year. I think Bryant does affect them because, I mean, man, just a solid receiver amongst solid receivers. I mean, they were almost unstoppable at times. So looking at this situation, I don't think that their offense is going to take a too big of a hit or just one guy out with all the talent they still have on that offense it's not that big of a deal for me personally right now best offense uh in this division for sure and of course i think you could even say you can argue in the afc uh so i mean i'm looking at this as they are going to be a, a difficult team uh their defense hey they're working on their defense they've actually added some pieces to the draft and the and they've actually kind of uh, put their heads together a little bit more here and said, okay, here's what we were doing wrong, here's what we can do right. So I'm liking what they're going with, the direction that this team is going. And uh, I think it really is between, you know, the Cincinnati Bengals and the Pittsburgh Steelers. And right now, uh, I mean, uh, I'm looking at the Steelers and saying, man, they're going to be a tough team in this division. Yeah, Pittsburgh's definitely going to be tough. Uh Yes, the suspension to Bryant is going to hurt, but uh, you have Antonio Brown, who's one of the best receivers in the league, if not the best. I definitely put him in my top three, most likely. Uh, I've never been the biggest fan of Big Ben, uh, but I have to give him all the credit in the world. He he, he just finds ways to win, at, and you give him the, the weapons that he has now, and the way they're going to try to use Bell and Williams in a more balanced role, I think, is going to work great. The defense is starting to improve, as Mike says. They've really kind of been focusing on on making that the priority as far as young talent goes, and and they really are one of the, the top teams in this conference. And again, it is the Bengals, it is the Steelers, and I think the Ravens will be right back in there too. But. I, it probably will become, you know, Steelers and Bengals as far as who would win the division and then maybe the Ravens for the wild card. But it's going to be a, a, a tough task to take out the Steelers any week. Yeah, certainly. And I think the Steelers, to me, even though they're without Martavis Bryant, I still think they're the first, they're the lead team in this division. I mean, if Ben Balthasberger can be a bit healthier this year and they don't lose uh, some offensive line health that they did last year. Uh, you know, those guys to stay healthy. You get Le'Veon, and I think that you definitely do need to go with the one-two punch of Williams and Bell. Uh, spell Bell a bit more so he's not having to carry everything on the load. Uh, rely some more on those receivers if you have to. Now you got Legereus Green, and, and you got, I mean, he's going to have to work that in uh, – with the, having the new tight end, but you know that defense was was pretty good last year. I think with another year of experience, another year of gelling. Uh, don't know if they necessarily have fixed the defensive back issue yet, but I mean they did okay with that being their glaring weakness last year. I think they can do it again this year, and with what the Bengals are are missing, I think this might be the time for the Steelers to take that division. So for me, I've got the standings that I think the Browns are. I'll give them four and twelve. They might be less than that. Uh, I'll say the Ravens at uh, nine and seven, the Bengals at ten and six, and the Steelers at eleven and five. And I think Steelers and Bengals go into the playoffs. Steelers win that division. Yeah, mine are actually really close to you. I'd probably have the Browns at four and twelve as well, and I would have it where you would have Pittsburgh and Cincinnati at ten and five, 
and uh, Baltimore at nine and six going into that last week. Of course, Pittsburgh would most likely take care of Cleveland, and then you go down to Baltimore and Cincinnati. It's at Cincinnati, so I'd give it to them. So give me Baltimore at nine and seven, and then a tie between Cincinnati and Pittsburgh at eleven and five. We'll give the tiebreaker for fun to Pittsburgh, uh, but I do think both teams will make the playoffs. Uh, you know, it, it's funny. We all are very similar. Um, I'll change up my records a little bit. I, I'm not going to change up Cleveland because I think four is a good number when it comes to winning at least. So four and 12 for them. I agree with you guys on that. I really feel that like Baltimore is going to be a competitive team. I, I think that they're going to do some good things. But I, I'll i be honest, I, I think they're one to two injuries away from being not so good. I, I, it's kind of like last year. I don't think they added enough depth to this team to make me think that if they lost a Flacco or they lost uh, even maybe one to two of their running backs or – as Suggs or anybody else in that defense, that they would be able to overcome it and, and you know do the things they need to do to keep winning. So I look at them probably in an eight and eight. I think they're just going to kind of fall short. They're going to be kind of right in the middle. Um, I'm looking at you know Cincinnati and the Pittsburgh Steelers in a neck and neck race. I think they're both going to be really fighting it out, and it probably is going to come down to that last week. You're right, Randy. Um, I'll just go ahead and say Pittsburgh. You know, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, eleven and five. Uh, Cincinnati ten and six. Both make the playoffs. All right. Well, we kind of have an agreement on this, so you probably know what that means. It's not going to happen. Nope. But <laughs> Cleveland Browns win the division. Mark it. Oh boy, <laughs> that would be crazy. Uh, oh, but man. so we wrap up the AFC next week with talking the AFC East, and we do. You know, as long as everything works out, I think we do have an actual last word Jets rider this time. So, I, I, I don't have to act as somebody else again. No, you don't have to act like somebody else again. Uh, but, you know, you might want to be on standby in case you do. Uh, so, um, I, I know I've got this uh, Aaron for the Dolphins, and uh, I know we got plenty of Bills and Patriots riders, so... We should have every team covered as we have been so far. Uh, thankfully, we've uh, struck with the 12 for 12. Let's hope we go 16 for 16. And, yeah, we'll be talking uh, AFCs next week and then move on to the NFC for the next four weeks after that. Of course, we'll be talking a Mountain West on the college football edition on uh, the Monday, on, on the Tuesday morning show, and and we had an NFL News Extra as well. If you're in our feeds, if you have either the WTO Network feed or just the you subscribe to the Football to the Max feed, uh, you should see the NFL News Extra in there where we talked about you know, Von Miller finally signing, Muhammad Wilkerson getting that extension, uh, so much other stuff that's been coming out over the weekend and everything. So make sure you want to, or make uh, you want to make sure you want to check that out. Uh, of course. Uh, Go rate and review on iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever. Uh, give us a give us a, a, a like if you care. You can go follow us on Twitter as well at WTM Sean at WTM Gary and at Randy Isbell. And uh, you know, check out the rest of stuff on WTM. Network. we just did the wrestling podcast, uh, Wrestling to the Max, previewing that Battleground pay per view that's about to happen on Sunday. A Super J Cup talk and more and. Video Games Podcast should be out on Saturday morning for you guys on the download. And, hey, uh, you know, you can go uh, check out Randy's Let's Plays of uh, uh, Until Dawn still. Yeah, getting to the end of Until Dawn. Yeah, so, you know, you can get uh, get scared along with Randy. So, <laughs> uh, well, until until Tuesday or until Friday. See you later, everybody.